What you're about to see is a unique perspective on a film set. With the filmmaker's permission, yet unbeknownst to the cast and crew, our behind-the-scenes camera operators mounted tiny hidden cameras onto the actual film cameras, as well as various locations around the set. Now, step inside a feature we like to call You Are In The Movie. Van Helsing! Trained by monks and mullahs from Tibet to Istanbul! Protected by Rome and Serbia! But like me, hunted by all others. The Knights of the Holy Order know all about you. It's no surprise that you know about me. Oh, but it is much more than that. the atmosphere of the movie. This particular part takes place under Rome. You have Van Helsing and the Cardinal in the confessional introducing the scene, and then the Cardinal pulls a lever, and the back of the confessional rises, and you see this tunnel with these mysterious stairs going away from you. 
We bring our guys from the confessional down these stairs. So again, it's quite a tight shot, a tunnel, a sort of enclosed claustrophobic space. And then as the camera tracks with them, we then open up into this enormous space, which is the Vatican Armory. We are the last defense against evil. An evil that the rest of mankind has no idea even exists. Van Helsing works for a, a secret society, which is made up of all the world's religions. It needed to be a place big enough to fit all the monks and priests and rabbis. The stage is 150 feet by 100 feet, and we filled it wall to wall, so that's basically the size of the set. But we've doubled the length of it. At the far end of the set is a large mirror, which is about 70 feet by 30 foot tall. And I've designed the set on a slight arc, a slight radius, so that it looks like a whole semicircle when it's reflected in the mirror. We're trying to create three different laboratories underneath the Vatican. We have the science, science one, the mechanical one, and then the weapons one, where we see swords being forged, machine guns being tested. It's sort of like this underground force of people working away building these, these weapons for this kind of secret war that's going on. You bring Mr. Hyde back or did you kill him? You killed him, didn't you? Why did get so annoyed? This is where Van Helsing meets Carl. Oh, right. Getting there. Carl is the person who gives him all the weaponry and instruction on how to handle vampires. He's a funny little character who, um, who has spent, I think, most of his life in a, a strange place underneath the Vatican in Rome. He's a man who uh, invents the most extraordinary inventions for people. His workbench, and this is where he creates a kind of nitroglycerin. Oh, sorry, sorry! He gives him all these weapons, and the, the most amazing is this brand new crossbow. Just pull the trigger and hold on. By far his heaviest and most awkward weapon, but that's kind of like, I would say it's like a machine gun of crossbows. Steve kept going, oh, come on, God, we're gonna send you to the gym. Jackman, you know, you can't even pick up the crossbow. Well, the damn thing was 45 pounds. This is brilliant. Man. That's brilliant. It's extraordinary. Where did you test it? On the ranch? Yeah. Wow. I shot a few dogs. <laughs> Incredible. Probably his coolest weapon would be the Chojo blades. This is, would be Van Helsing's knife, which is kind of like a flying frisbee of blades that he could charge up, aim, and fire, and, and you know, just does serious, serious damage. He gives me uh, crucifixes and rings of garlic and um, silver, silver stakes that shoot up, you know, sort of like a, a flick knife version of a silver stake. All the props in Van Helsing are a lot larger than you would think they would be, and th that stake was probably, you know, 16 inches long and heavy. I have inside that coat, if you count the movie, something like 14 weapons. A movie like Van Helsing, it's a fantasy. You have a lot of creative licensing as to what you can do. I mean, some of the guns we made were based on guns that didn't even come out to the 1920s. But, you know, we used its style for something in the 1800s. Well, that was meant to be like a technology development center for this 1880s. So it wasn't just somewhere where the weapons were made. It was also a place where they were developing various areas of technology, like flying machines, chemistry experiments, building crazy machinery. And we had stuff copied at the Science Museum in London. They made the magic lantern for us. And that was fully practical, actually. We've got these giant furnaces with people forging the swords and the metal workers and hammering and smoke and atmosphere and lots of extras. For the weapon making, dismantled a forge here at a water mill outside Prague, which was brilliant and we brought it all back and lit up the forges, special effects, did a lot of work to make all that look practical. From the concept drawings to the architectural drawing to the tradespeople, the carpenter starting to build was a six-month process. We probably had been actually building on the stage for about 12 weeks. We've shot for four days, and it'll probably be eight, seven or eight minutes in the movie, if that, and probably less. He did an amazing job. He just looks huge, ginormous, as I usually say. This is the kind of canvas I like to work on, incredibly big visual, you know, entertainment movies, and uh, that's what it is. It's just hopefully it's a really big, fun ride, but it's also uh, it's a great story.
tus trailers. Visita mi canal. Just from an efficiency and a financial point of view, I, I like to revamp sets. So we shoot it as one thing, then the unit goes away, shoots other sets, and while they're away, we turn that particular set into another set. Starts off as Dracula's coffin room with a very ornate coffin in the middle of the room, and there's a whole sequence is played out in there. You got yes, master. How long before we are ready? Soon, master. Very soon. And when Stevens finished with that sequence, they go away and he's left set and shoot another set. And we turn that into Dracula's laboratory. Need any help? Really? <gasps> this started with having a chance to read the script and get a sense of all of it. You know, from the Mummy Returns experience, that you're only going to get so much from the script. You're going to really have to see the kinetic side of how he shoots it and all. And when I started to see the footage, it was just what I expected. I try to only work with the best of the best so they all make me look good. And yeah, no, he's all over. He's such a good friend. And you know, he read it and he said, oh, I gotta get this together. <laughs> this kind of film, you really can't wait to see finished images. You kind of have to start or never make it. So it's great every time a new shot comes in, whether I've written the cue or will be writing it, it's just great to see the difference as these shots are completed and the difference in the feel of, of how everything seems to go together. The difference in the feel of, of you have to find the right voice for the film. And Steve was very specific about, I think, a key area. This was not going to be a horror movie on any level. It was a romantic action-adventure monster movie. There are a number of themes. There's a very clearly heroic action-adventure theme, and we're actually having some fun with that theme because there's a moment where this gal kind of falls from the sky out of the clutches of a vampire, and the sidekick, Carl, catches her. And Carl gets the heroic music when he catches the girl. And, of course, Anna gets it when she needs it, and Van Helsing gets it. And Frankenstein gets it in the sequence we just did, where he grabs Van Helsing from going under the wheels of the carriage. He gets the heroic thing. So that kind of universally takes care of all of the heroic moments.
Then there's this kind of more like the legend slash romantic cue. <gasps> Why? Oh, you're choking me. Give me reason not to. I can't. If people knew. No. Oh. It's an interesting tone in the love story. It's not this out and out overtly huggy kissy kind of romance between these two. Before or after I stopped you from shooting him? Before. And still you tried to kill him! He's a werewolf. He's gonna kill people! He can't help it! It's not his fault! I know, but he'll do it anyway! Do you understand forgiveness? It's got all of the sexual tension, but they're also fellow warriors as they go through the film. So the romantic theme is kind of tempered with a little bit of the overview legend, big epic sense to it. You know, to have memories of those you loved and lost is perhaps harder than to have no memories at all. All right. We look for your brother. The Dracula stuff is very powerful stuff. So we have a lot of low end percussion and a lot of strong brass. Igor? Yes, Master. How long before we are ready? Soon, Master. Very soon. To two strangers, visit my channel. Vampires have this very kind of gothic over the top with voices and all material that kind of travels through the film. Van Helsing's theme, which is kind of unique to him, he's got a very kind of tracky vibe to him when he's off doing his montage business. I believe we've got a 60 voice choir. They're bringing a lot to the overall scope of things. I don't set out kind of a clear plan about all that. I kind of work my way through and go, hmm, need something here. Then you find what you need. And then when you find that moment again, you go, found that already. And that's kind of how it organically builds rather than kind of getting too analytical about it. I wouldn't redo it for that, you know? Okay. Yeah, and I think, yeah. And Dennis can help that. I have to say that there's never been a better fit than, than Alan because from day one, from the first cue, uh, the first time the first cue comes up, you just go, okay, well, here's another home run. Alan has done it again. We've got, I think, about 115 plus minutes of music, which is twice the amount of music in the average film. And so I saw the film for the first time sometime around December 15th, middle of December. Took my family on a goodbye vacation <laughs> between Christmas and New Year's, and I started literally seven days a week since January 2nd. And here we are about to go into April and 
I'm still chasing the movie. I like that. That, that one works. All this, that, and then all this, that, Then we want to wind up. Now we get the tritone, which might be all right. That's cool. No, that's cool. Okay. Very often you wind up in a situation with the director where they're really great at describing what they want, but that's not the movie they made. The best description you get from Steve is the movie he's made, scene by scene. And so what he basically does then is confirm that, yes, the movie you're looking at is the movie I wanted to make, and it's the movie I want you to score. And that really helps a great deal because he's very clear at every step of the way. We're in. A great deal. Good. Because he's We're cool, man. Yeah. Yeah. Let's okay. rock on. Go, go, go! Come on! Good. We're cool, man. I used to subscribe to Monster Magazine when I was a kid, and I loved all of those great Dracula, Wolfman, Frankenstein films, so this has been a real blast to kind of have, have a whack at them.